reverse book club of 2021. Very, very excited to uh, see the room filling up. I got to let a couple more people in here real quick. We are uh, really excited about this topic uh, for a lot of reasons, and I'm just going to go ahead and kick things off before we turn it over uh, to Mr. Scott Phillips. I uh, want to have a, a brief conversation about, you know, really how we, how do we, how do we come to this concept? Um, you know, Scott and I uh, were chatting, I think it was right before the holidays, um, and Scott and I share an Audible account where we have uh, almost 600 books on our Audible account that we have built uh, uh, over the course, or I've built over the course of the last several years, uh, and Scott's a part of it. And uh, what's, really, what's really neat about it is, is sometimes I'll see a book, somebody will buy a book, add it to the account, and I'll be like, ah, that's really interesting. I really want to read that book. Uh, and then I don't. And instead, I just call up the person who bought the book, and I'm like, well, well tell me about uh, you know, this book or that book. And in a 20-minute conversation, I get the download from the book. And it's really great. And so we said, what if we started doing this for our agents, right? Like we're obviously benefiting from it amongst ourselves. And we said, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's dive in. Let's do the first one. We'll do it together. It'll be a great thing. Um, and I went out and I bought the book. I've got it on Audible and I'll be damned if I still didn't read it. Uh, so thank God <laughs> Scott Phillips did. Uh, and so we are, uh, we're in very good hands today, uh, but we're, we're very excited to, uh, to pilot this program. The number one thing uh, that we're looking from you guys uh, today is it would love would love some participation. As always, we know these Zoom things can be pretty dry if we're not asking questions and participating. But also want to know what do you like or what do you not like? What would improve this model um, from a uh, from an education standpoint? And then finally, if there are books that have been sitting on your shelf uh, or in your Audible account or in your Amazon queue that you have not read yet, and you're like, I, I need somebody to read this book for me, we will gladly be your leverage uh, because it'll be uh, good accountability for ourselves to read those. So please, feedback, participation, and book recommendations are, uh, are, the, are what's gonna be due as, uh, as your, your payment for today's fun. Um, and I think that about does it. Scott, without any further ado, you already got the screen mm -hmm. shared. Well, I'm going to spotlight you so nobody sees my mug, uh, and we'll go from there, my friend. All right. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. And uh, for, for many of you, I'm looking through the, the list. I haven't met some of you. Of course, I'm super unfamiliar with the folks who don't use their names on Zoom. Uh, hopefully, you guys are friendly spies and not the evil ones. But uh, welcome to the First Reverse Book Club, as Mike said. Um, we're going to be doing this on The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And um, before we get launching here i wanted to just let you guys know like this is the kind of um stuff that really makes me proud to work with our leadership team um not just mike but uh but the, the rest of the team obviously danielle julia carrie sierra um andrew our broker our productivity coaches mike and eric i mean we we have actually really spent a lot of time digging in deep to see what it would take to be the number one uh place for realtors to go out and build and grow their businesses and uh, one of those those items was, you know, provide education. That's not just the simple, um, you know, how can I go out and, and list a home? You know, if you Google that, you could find 300 YouTube videos on listing presentations. But what you can't find um, all the time is ways to, to make yourself a smarter business person. Uh, and in this case, somebody who has um, a really good understanding of wealth and what that means. And, and one of our uh, many missions that we have at Keller Williams, the most prominent one is to build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living. And of course, uh, you know, we also have experiences worth giving and legacies worth leaving. But as I look at, um, you know, I spend most of my time talking about building businesses worth owning. And I want to be clear with you, that's not what we're going to talk about today. It's probably the first time I've ever been able to say that in a class that, um, that I'm facilitating. Um, we are actually going to focus more on lives worth living. And I guess in this case, legacies worth leaving, because we're going to be talking about generational wealth, how to build that wealth. And, and really, no matter how deep uh, the background imagery of my shared screen makes you think, um, you should be able to come out of this with something um, that applies to you today 
down the road shortly and, and even as far out as 30 years. And if the topics uh, you know, continue to burn at a, at, a, at a good rate and everyone's engaged, um, I'm willing to stay here as late as 11 a.m. and uh, actually go through a couple of real actionable items um, with you guys um, to make sure that you get the most out of the day and that it's actually something that you can apply. So looking forward to getting started. Um, Mike, give me a thumbs up here. It looks like we're at about 30 people. Is that about what we anticipate? So he's actually on mute, but I can hear him because he's just on the other side of that wall. So it's it's fine. It's like we're having a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, we're yeah we're at thirty. It's uh, about our expectation. I uh, I'll Perfect. be walking the door, uh, a la the old bouncer days. So we'll be getting people in uh, as they come in. But yeah, man, you uh, run with it. All right, here we go. Well, so welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about the psychology of money. This uh, will have a. Um, you know, slides going throughout this, they will have some things on them, but understand is it's our first reverse book, book club. And this has like the 18 principles. Of course, it couldn't be like the three key ones. It had to be, you know, almost 20. Um, there will be a lot of things that we talk about that I bring up that are not, um, you know, in the slides. And then in terms of questions, my preference would be, if you don't mind, if you have questions, um, throw them in the chat and, uh, and we'll make sure that they get answered. My, I'll get alerts for that. I'll see that. And um, we'll make sure that if you, you know, we, we stop, pause, and elaborate on a topic. And then I'll make sure we build in some, some pause points where we can come back and hit some topics. So here we go. Let's see if I can get this thing rocking and rolling. Looks like we can. All right. So uh, first and foremost, let's talk about the greatest show on earth. And the greatest show on earth is, uh, is a, a metaphor, obviously. Uh, but it's really the, the premise of the whole book uh, the psychology of money. And that's that, um, you know, doing well with money is not nearly about how smart you are, how intellectual you are, how many degrees you have, or, or how, you know, well you did in college. It's mostly um, about how you behave. It's actual actions over time. Um, the second point is that uh, a genius with no emotional control, in other words, no awareness of what we're going to talk about today, can be a complete financial disaster. And that the opposite is true. An ordinary person with no formal education can actually be an can be extraordinarily wealthy. I'm gonna give you guys a couple examples that they use in the book. And, and this was really um, something that impressed me a lot. I, I don't know if anyone had read the book, The Millionaire Next Door. I, I think I did a long time ago, but they actually brought up a, a person who was referenced in that book. And it was a gas station uh, attendant, janitor and American philanthropist. And I'll say those things again, a gas station attendant a janitor and a huge American philanthropist. And it's the same person. Um, the story was the, of the man named Ronald James Reed. And it talks about how he lived his life as a gas station attendant and janitor frugally through his whole life and amassed a net worth of $8 million at the time that he died. And the majority of his fortune was left to the local hospital and library. And uh, there's conversation in this about how could a janitor and, you know, a, a janitor and uh, gas station attendant end up with eight million dollars at the end of his life to leave as a, as a legacy gift how did he he do that and uh, you know without any formal education without any massive influxes of wealth without you know mass holdings and real estate on the side or anything like that and that's a lot of it uh, to support the behaviors that we're going to talk about today or the explanation for how he did that um, by contrast you know they, they spoke about a young executive and I wanted to share this story because, um, you know, in real estate, some of us, uh, this, this really caught me because in real estate, we see a lot of these uh, folks that, you know, want to share a lot about their lives, particularly on social media and showcase, uh, you know, we, we call it flexing uh, in, in my generation, but they want to show how great their lives are. They, they put pictures of themselves on private jets or they take photographs of themselves to show something that they're doing that's expensive or elaborate. And there was a story in the book about a young man who uh, was in uh, the greater Los Angeles area, and he had a huge ego. He had amassed a ton of wealth in a very short period of time. He was worth like $6.5 million or something really, really nutty in like in his 20s. And he used to go to this restaurant in, in the greater Calabasas area and just spend thousands of dollars on everything and notoriously get rowdy. So one night he was at dinner and he went to, a, uh, he went to the valet attendant. Um, at the door and he said, hey, I want you to go up the street to this jewelry store and buy me $10,000 worth of gold coins. And he handed the guy $10,000 and said, buy me $10,000 of gold coins. So of course, the valet attendant, or, or excuse me, the door attendant said, I, sure, okay. Went up, got the $10,000 of gold coins. And this is not a fictional story, true story directly from the author because he was the door attendant. 
He said that when he came back and gave him the gold coins, he and all his buddies finished dinner, went to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, took $10,000 of gold coins and skipped them like stones into the ocean. They literally threw $10,000 of money into the ocean just because they could. That kind of behavior, not surprisingly, caused this young man to declare bankruptcy at age 35. His businesses are completely gone under. He tried to sell one at the last minute to get some kind of bailout. And I don't know where he uh, stands today. But it shows that amassing an sh- amount of money in a short period of time does not mean that you are going to be generationally wealthy for life. The gas station attendant and janitor was able to save $8 million for the balance of his life on a gas station attendant and janitor's salary. The, the super successful young tech mogul was literally throwing 10 grand into the ocean. What's the lesson? How you behave. How you behave is more important than how, how initially successful you are, or how well-educated you are when it comes to money. Um, something to consider is that we think about, um, and we're taught about money a lot like physics, as though there's like rules and laws, but understand that money is heavily, heavily influenced by our psychology. Um, there is, uh, t- you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, why do people cripple themselves in debt? You know, they, they get completely overwhelmed with, with debt and credit card burdens and, and, you know, mortgages on every property that they have and vacation homes. And I think there's probably three things that, um, that are out there that you, you know, we'll hear throughout this reverse book club. And that is this greed, insecurity, getting insecure with their own selves and optimism. They're overly confident. They're insecure with how they might appear in their, their group of friends or their peers and, and greed. Um, so let's dive in. Right. No one is crazy. I might actually contend that that's not true, but there's hope for some of us after all. No one is crazy. No amount of studying or open-mindedness can recreate the power of fear and uncertainty. So let's talk about that. Your personal experience, your personal experiences in our lives, as we look out and we, we take our life and extrapolate it across the, the lives of everyone in the world over the time that we will live, which is hopefully a very long time, makes up whatever we're calling that decimal with a bunch of zeros and then a 1% of what's actually happening in the world. So think about that for a minute. What you woke up and dealt with this morning, a sore back, a a kid that didn't want to go to school because it was too cold, whatever situations were yours today, make up a micro fraction of a micro fraction of a micro fraction of the actual world's experiences today. Yet they make up probably 80% of the reasons why you make decisions or 80% of the way that you think the world works, right? If you woke up with a backache today, do you really care that someone in San Francisco didn't or did? Uh, We'll get to that later, but you'll understand that there's an effect um, on your life of all kinds of other things, but we focus on what we see and what we're feeling, and that predominantly dictates our actual decisions. It doesn't make us crazy, but understand that we are all seeing the world through our own unique lenses. in other words, like we've, uh, we, we think we know everything, but in reality, we've only experienced a very tiny sliver of the world. And I wanted to, to you know, say this, you know, when we talk about nobody being crazy, um, there is a, there, there's a group of people that buy lottery tickets. And, and let's do this for a quick interaction, pick, uh, uh, please. If you buy, buy or regularly or have bought lottery tickets, especially in the past month when it went up to almost a billion dollars, go ahead and throw something in the chat box and just say me. I just want to get a sense of this because this was something that really shocked me. Um, how many people buy lottery tickets still? I'm going to try to see if I can see the chat box, of course. There it is. Bunch of people, right? So, a bunch of people and <laughs> some never. Not Cindy Sobel. I could have guaranteed that, Cindy. So I was, I was mind blown by this idea, again, because my view of the world is that buying a lottery ticket is like throwing money away, right? You've got one in one billion odds of winning something, and you just continually throw it away. And I, I threw this on here because I thought it just offered a unique perspective. And it's not a judgmental comment. It's just something to understand how psychology can influence people's understanding of risk. If I walked up to any one of you and said, hey, I want you to give me $100, and I'm going to give you a one in one billion chance of winning a bunch of money. Most of you would not give me the hundred dollars, right? You would look at me like I was crazy. One in a billion, why on earth would I take any kind of odds like that? Understand that the people most likely to purchase lottery tickets, again, not you, but the people most likely statistically to purchase lottery tickets in the US are actually low income households. This blew my mind. 
that spend an average of $400 a year on lottery tickets because psychologically in their heads, it's their only hope and dream for wealth. They don't believe necessarily, again, present company excluded, but the average American might not believe that they have the opportunity to build the wealth that we are gonna talk about today. Um, that's not that difficult uh, to build. It's all about behavior. And um, no disrespect to the many people who said yes, but I don't think the science behind uh, winning the lottery is, uh, is, is super concrete. So I think it's mostly going to be luck and risk. So luck and risk, let's talk a little bit about that. Our outcomes are determined by more than our effort. Luck and risk are often figuring predominantly in our individual outcomes. So I'm going to share with you guys uh, a, a story here, um, you know, just because the author's story was uh, a little boring. So, you know, the accidental impact of actions taken outside your control can be more consequential than the ones you consciously take. So if you're writing things down or screenshotting, you can save that. But I'm going to explain to you guys what that actually means with the story, if you don't mind. Now, some of you have known me a long time. We've been through a lot of uh, trainings together and classes and business planning clinics. And you know that I share a lot of autobiographical stories. So I'm going to share one with you now. Um, I've done fairly well as a, as a real estate agent. Um, sold, you know, for a five-year period, I was the top producer in our market center with our team. We sold between 25 and $50 million a year, 45 million a year thereabouts. Um, exceeded a million dollars in GCI a few years in a row, um, had a really good run as a realtor. But I actually had to think back about luck and risk and the impacts of random things happening and how those random things actually impact our future, even though we think we're in complete control of everything that we do. In 2007, I decided I wanted to play football for the Browns. I wanted to help them win a Super Bowl by being a quarterback, but I knew in order to play for the Browns, I had to play somewhere else first. So I became an arena football quarterback. I trained seven days a week, literally ate enough food to make myself heavy and, and strong and so forth. And I ended up making an arena football team. When I made that arena football team, I was making $300 a week. Let's make sure you guys heard that. I was making $300 a week as a professional athlete playing arena football in Canton. At the end of my first year as an arena football athlete, I was uh, released from my team, but invited to play for the Marion Mayhem, which was about two hours away. I drove down to Columbus, stayed at a buddy's house for the night, went to their tryout, was told, you're guaranteed gonna make this team, it would be great. Their pay was $250 a week. The gas at that point in 2008 and nine to get back and forth to Marion for practice three days a week in games would have exceeded what I was making. So I quit. I decided to play semi-pro and, and I left the arena leagues. And guess what I focused my time on? Real estate. But I want you to think about this for a minute. My life could have been totally different. What could have happened was I could have had an incredibly successful career with the Canton Legends, been promoted maybe to the Cleveland Gladiators where quarterbacks make 75000 a year, all the way up to 150 for like two years till we get our brains beat in. And then when we can't see straight anymore and we've got no you know, formal higher education or career momentum, we retire with $100,000 maybe of income over that, over that year or two that you play. See, there was luck in a lot of my success in real estate. Had I succeeded in football, I would have never even applied myself to real estate, but I had no choice. That was the only job I had left was real estate. So I had to succeed. The one used in the books was actually talking about Bill Gates. It said that Bill Gates, when he founded Microsoft, you know, he talks all about his high school and how his high school is the only reason that Microsoft even exists. Because in 1968, his school was one of the few schools, three in the entire country that was able to procure a teletype computer. Three high schools in the entire country in 1968 had a teletype computer. One of them was Bill Gates's. If it weren't for the fact that Bill Gates just happened to attend that high school, he would have never found his passion for computers and Microsoft would have probably never existed or at least he, his involvement with it would have, uh, would have never existed. So I want us to understand a couple things with luck and risk. Um, there is way more that happens in wealth beyond our control or beyond our plans that impacts our financial future than we realize. And for uh, people like Cindy and myself and some of the control freaks out there, um, we might not be okay hearing that, but it is true. There's a lot of things beyond our control that are impacting our wealth. And as we go back just for a minute to lottery tickets, I want you to think of this. Extreme outcomes are incredibly low probability outcomes. Applying the lessons of those who, applying the lessons of those who have achieved those outcomes um, is, is basically putting yourself against like an immeasurable task. So there's tons of people out there who reach out and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna model my, my business after, after what Bill Gates did. And it's like, 
that's awesome. Like we want to model after Bill Gates, but listen to what I just said. Bill Gates was predominantly his whole interest in the entire computer world was, was completely coincidental. It was based on luck. He had no awareness of what a computer was, but for the fact that he went to that high school. Is it possible for us to recreate a random circumstance to be the entrepreneurs that come up with something no one else has thought of? It's possible, but is it likely and is that what we should be planning for? Of course not. Instead, in the psychology of money, it's said that we should be focusing on the broad patterns and take directional insights from those patterns, but not necessarily get married to the people who have had super outlying, uh, outlying experiences. Um, all right. So let's jump forward here. So when is enough enough? When is enough? So this is something that, um, that you know, really when I was reading this, I, I went into my own kind of personal uh, tank, uh, think tank uh, of my own life, got a little introspective. But I also thought of some of my peers here uh, in this company, many of you guys who are actually on this today, and I'm appreciative of your time. Um, I started thinking about us and, uh, and how we've been, um, how we kind of fare uh, when answering this question, when is enough? Um, the, the principle that the chapter wants you to understand, I'll give you first, is that there's no reason to risk what we have and what we need for what we don't have and especially what we don't need. So I'll let that sink in for a minute. There's no reason for us to be putting at risk what we already have and need for what we don't have and don't need. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this for a minute. I'm, I'm going to open, op I'm going to look in the chat box. I'd like you guys to share some, some things that you have and need right now. What are things that you have and you need right now in your life? I need a vehicle. Absolutely. That's true. What is something you have and you need that you wouldn't want to risk? My home. I think that's a fair assessment. I would not want to risk my home, right? A lot of people are going to say their homes. <laughs> phone. Yes, that is true. You do not want to put your phone at risk. I agree. Your, your dog. Okay. Have a savings account. I need reoccurring income. A great family. Yes. Would you want to put your family at risk for what you don't need? My health. Would I want to put my health at, need, at risk, right? So there's no reason to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and you don't need. Yet, people literally risk the exact things, maybe aside from the phone and dog. I have seen people who have risked many of the things on this list for things that they don't need. I mean, I'm not going to ask you for personal stories, okay? I'll be autobiographical. I'm not going to ask you to get too introspective here, but give me a bit of a thumbs up here. If you know someone who's put a mortgage or second mortgage on their home, so that they can do something, whether it's buy a boat, buy a house, start a business, whatever, but they've literally put debt against their house. They have bet against their own home in order to do something. I know I have. I know I have. I think several of you have as well. So I want you to consider why would somebody do that? And that's what this is really about, right? The psychology of money is about understanding the thought processes that go into this. Because logically, if I said to you, Mike, you know, would you want to go into a risky investment? All you need to do is take a hundred thousand dollar mortgage out against your house that you had paid off. You know, conceptually, you'd go, no. Why would I borrow money to get into some risky investment with you? Yet people do it all the time. Well, here's a couple of the reasons why people might do that. A couple of the reasons that people might do that is this: comparison. Comparison to others is a culprit. Social comparison is a process to that end. There's always someone higher up the ladder. Let me share with you guys what that means to me. Wealth, envy, it's a never ending, uh, it's a never ending burden. There's always someone higher up the ladder was the, the last sentence of the second bullet. And, and understand this, there are people who will be in your life who have way more than you have materially, or they have things that you might desire to have, or that you might look at them and say, wow, that person's got something and, and I should have that something. So now I'm going to go get something like that. And if we haven't built up our financial security, which we're going to talk about later, when is enough enough? How likely will we be to spend the money that we have earned on things that allow us to be socially comparable to those that we spend our time with? Um, one of the number one things, and by the way, I'm not calling any of you out. I'm calling myself out. Okay. The, one of the number one things that happens when you become a real estate agent that makes hundred thousand dollars a year is you make an investment in a German car. Wait for it. I'll say it again. One of the number one things that happens, when you become a reasonably successful real estate agent is you go out and you buy a German car. 
a bunch of people are smiling right now. I think a bunch of you guys are hiding on mute, or two of them. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate your honesty. Else, <laughs> there it is. It's not the greed that rules the world. It's the envy or Prius. Andrew, you weren't successful back then. I don't know what to tell you, man. That was you were trying to save money on gas. No, you were very successful. Andrew, you are the opposite of this. But yes, I have done it, guys. I did it. I one of the first things I did is when I made my first hundred grand, I traded in my Kia Optima and I got a. Um, old Mercedes S550 because social comparison was important to me. I didn't want to look like the guy that didn't have anything. And by the way, guess what? My business partner at the time was driving an Audi and he was there and I was selling more homes than him. So I was like, well, I need to have a German car too, because you know, I don't want him looking like he's more successful than me. I'm way, I'm way out selling him. Guess what? It is a, it is a huge, huge risk it is a huge, huge risk. And don't worry, I'm not judging anybody. I still, still have a love for German cars, but it's a, uh, a good point. All right, many things are not worth risking though. Okay, so putting a little of your money at risk, you know, you decide, but there are things that are not worth risking and that's reputation, freedom, family and friends, love and happiness. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more about that uh, later. Kobe, I uh, just saw your comment. I bought a German car when I made my first $100,000 while I was living in my parents' basement. That is completely autobiographical and I appreciate you sharing because there are lots of real estate agents, not just on this today, but also, uh, not just on this today, but also just, you know, people who we know and care about that will probably do the same thing. All right. So let's talk about compounding here. We're going to jump a little bit. Confounding compounding. What does this mean? Oops. Oh, Got to go back here. Oh my gosh. I'm all over the place. There we go. Still learning how to use Zoom after all these months. All right. So just want to give you a real quick thing. I don't want to give you guys a lesson on compounding interest. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to throw that into a calculator later on, and we're going to show how much money you could you could have in 20 and 30 years with uh, with a starting balance and just average rates. We'll do that. So let me just give you a couple highlights from the book on this. Compounding the compounding effect is one of the most important lessons in the book. And and what it actually says is get ready for this and go ahead and tell Seth and Sharon, the guy who owns Berkshire Hathaway, not locally, but you know, Warren Buffett, right? The, the executive chairman of uh, Berkshire Hathaway is actually not a great investor. Let that sink in for a minute. He's actually not a great investor. In fact, most of the wealth that Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett have amassed has happened in the past 16 years. He's been investing for 75. He's actually not a great investor. He just has time on his side. He made good investments over a long, long, long period of time. The secret to good investing is just this. It's time. How long are you going to put it in there? How long are you going to put your money, keep money from your paycheck from going into things like German cars and toys, and instead put it to work for you such that it, evolve, it results in something greater than what it is in your pocket uh, over time? You can become rich very, very quickly. It is very hard to become wealthy, and we're going to talk about that. We'll take a look at a compound interest, in, interest calculator at the end of today's session, and we're doing fine on time. But I want you guys to uh, consider that if for some reason you have to jump off, Put this word in, in on a notepad that you won't forget to go back and do it later. Just Google search uh, compound interest calculator. Um, I'll show you an example of one later on, but compounding interest calculator, and it will show you can plug numbers right into it. And, uh, and it'll actually give you a sense of, you know, where you will be uh, financially if you, if you were to start putting money away now. So it kind of hinted at this, but chapter five of the book was about getting wealthy versus staying wealthy. And, you know, it's an interesting thing is that a um, little out of order here, but um, getting money requires risk right? Putting yourself out there. So um, what are some things that we have risked to earn money? Go ahead and blow up the chat box. What are some things that we have put at risk to make money in our industry or, or in our prior industry? I know Cindy's had some jobs before real estate that uh, she might want to bring up. I'll never forget it, Cindy. Can't forget it now. <laughs> um, so what are some things that we've risked? I see time. What else have we risked? We've put at risk to earn our money. I'll, I'll throw one out there. I'm not going to sit here and list, make you all listen to me type. I had to risk my um, my reputation, right? I had to cold call lots of people and like my ego. I had to get hung up on a lot and told that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I'm just, you know, some some crazy person who's trying to hustle real estate. Britt says, hell, absolutely, Brittany. What if we put at risk to earn money? Time with our family, absolutely. Track records of success. We've risked our sleep, right? Some of you guys have invested in business. Did all of you guys get the scholarships to get your license or did you pay out of your own uh, pocket for your licensure? I, I can't remember how that works. Yeah, we put money, we met time with our family, leaving my job to become a realtor. I risked security of a salary I had to become an independent business owner. Absolutely, so thank you guys for sharing that. I'm gonna just get back to it here. So getting money 
right, requires risk. It requires putting yourself out there. But keeping money is different. Keeping money is actually the opposite. It requires a fear, a fear that you might actually lose something, right? It might requires this like saying, okay, I actually have it now. Oh my gosh, I don't want to lose it all. I, I finally got something. And, and really what, you know, the, the two key words I pulled out of this chapter were frugality and paranoia, which unfortunately has really bad outlook for me because I don't really define myself as either frugal nor paranoid. But I have to tell you, I might have to adopt some of those traits because if not for that, it's very difficult to stay wealthy, according to the author. Um, there was a, uh, you know, there was a, um, <laughs> actually a, a football coach, sorry, who had this uh, term he used to say when we would, when we would throw the ball uh, as a quarterback, he said, you can't go broke taking a profit. If there's a guy open two yards downfield, flip it to him and let him run with it. Because as long as you go forward, you're always going to be, be doing better than, than you were versus taking some incredible risk. I would say this, when you're, when you're playing with a lead in football or in life, when you finally have amassed some money, consider that you can't go broke by taking a profit on that money, putting it in something incredibly risky, taking that, that money that you've now earned that you have okay, in your pocket finally in some cases, right? We've waited our whole lives to have any kind of fortune. Um, we finally have it. Putting it all in something incredibly risky is not the way to stay wealthy. You can't go broke taking a profit. And consider that the most important plan is oftentimes to plan for the fact that things don't go according to plan. There are, there are circumstances that are long, are way beyond our control. And, um, and, and those, those things do happen. I'll, I'll give you an example, um, forgetting what happened two weeks ago in the stock market, but um, we saw uh, in March um, something completely that maybe we should have anticipated because I remember Sean and Don telling us all about coronavirus and how it was going to impact the markets and it was impacting the markets in China and they expected it to be an issue in, in America. And uh, I remember standing at the front of the room laughing about it and saying, ah, oh, <laughs> that's funny, a Chinese virus is doing blah, blah, blah to the stock market. That, that'll never happen here. What happened in March? Many stocks went down by 80 to 90% in a matter of days. Days. Isn't that crazy? So we have to understand that things don't always go according to plan. If somebody was planning that day to withdraw all of their, their reti retirement savings from their IRA or 401k that Friday that the government shut down, right? They, they didn't have uh, their plan as strong as it might have seemed. It wasn't actually that good because they just lost 85% of their, of their wealth seemingly overnight in a matter of three days. And by the way, if they pulled it out anyway, because they got scared, they missed the entire bounce back, which has happened already now over the 11 months that followed. So understanding that staying wealthy is about paranoia, frugality, and understanding that things might not always go according to your plan. They don't always go up by 4% per year if you're in the stock market as an example. And one of the things that we have to leave some room for error. Um, and I, we, you know, we're gonna talk about this, I think a number of times, um, not there, but I wanna make sure that we leave a little bit of room for error. So um, if you have the exact amount of money that you think you need, understand that that could change. There's a lot of things that happen in life. And uh, to avoid getting overly personal with all, or having you guys all get overly personal, I won't ask this to be in the chat box, but go internal for a moment and consider that there are things in your life that, that happened or happen right now that you didn't expect and that you didn't plan for. And then ask yourself if those happened again, would that have been better if I'd have left more of a room for error. Uh, many of you who've known me a long time know that, uh, I can't believe it was this long ago now, but six and a half years ago, roughly my father-in-law very abruptly didn't wake up one morning. He passed away very unexpectedly and he was caring for my mother-in-law who was sick with terminal brain cancer. At that moment in my life, my entire savings account was depleted to build an addition on my home and a first floor bedroom so that I could take care of a terminal cancer patient. But the day before that, I had no idea that was something I was ever gonna have to do take care of somebody who was sick. How much different would that have been if I'd have had significantly more funds available to my life to be able to do that? Or con uh, contrastingly, if I'd have had none, if I'd have been making just enough money to get by, live a high quality of life, but I hadn't saved any money, how would I have handled that? So plan for the fact that things don't go according to plan. That's one of the keys that our author talks about uh, to staying wealthy. All right, freedom. So freedom, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, freedom is the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want. And I know you've heard that before. Where have you heard that before? Go ahead. You can throw that in the chat box. I'm certain that's been said many a time by some famous people in our industry. 
you can't get the chat box up now, of course. See, it's like, there we go. Who have we heard that from? Freedom. Ben Ginny, Eric? <laughs> Guessing that was supposed to be a K. Ben Kinney, Gary Keller is the one that I hear it from all the time, definitely. Um, but we've been hearing it a lot on our, on our coaching calls and whatnot is that freedom is really the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want for as long as you want. It's something that we talk about in, in MAPS coaching a lot. And I've also heard it mentioned in bolds before. Is, and that is really what we should be striving for because money's greatest intrinsic value is the ability to give you control over your time. So let's consider this for a minute. This author, you would almost think was... Uh, perhaps in, uh, in MAPS coaching for some of the, the key takeaways from the chapter on freedom. Um, what he talks about is that money is good for the good it can do. So money can be used to go buy gold coins and skip them like, like stones and seashells into the ocean. That is an option you can use money for. Or money can be used to create things like incredible financial generational security and wealth for your, your children, your community, you're, you're the people that you care about. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your, your neighborhood, whatever it is. Money can be used for all of those things. And perhaps the most important value of money is your ability to control your time. So let me put it to you this way. Right now, if I threw out a, a buyer, and I don't know how many participants we got here, Mike, we have 37 going on, 38 people in this chat. That's accurate. If I said oh, right now, I have a 100 and actually I do, let's say so. I have a $350,000 buyer right now that I can give to anyone on this call. How many of you guys would want it? Phil immediately got, he claims first. I want everyone who would want a $350,000 buyer right now to go ahead and put me in the chat box. I'm just gonna see just how many people would say yes to this. Natalie, Alice, okay, oh my gosh, everyone. <laughs> I would take it then refer it. <laughs> Get a double referral on it. Eric Akbar, I didn't even know he runs buyers. He's saying yes. Chase Group says yes, Cindy. Okay, so you get to keep, you can keep blowing it up as you want. My team would take it, Art. Absolutely, right? If I said a $350,000 buyer I could give you right now, which I could, um, no matter what, most people would take it, right? Now, if I gave you the balance of the details, which is that the buyer is looking to see 150 homes, is not pre-approved, is not certain if they're going to buy, but they're going to be in town today only from 12 o'clock until eight o'clock, and they want to see homes ranging from Columbia Station all the way to Conneaut. Thank you, Allison. You win. <laughs> Monica would be supporting. Never mind. Hell no. Absolutely not, right? The freedom of having money, having wealth, is your ability to control your time. It's the ability to not look at that and go, oh my gosh, I just need that money so bad. I have to take the risk on that $350,000 buyer who's going to drive me from Lorraine to Lake County and has to see 100 homes in a day, which by the way, Let's just keep being honest here. Throw in the chat box if you've had a person like that before. Here, I'll give you a hint. I absolutely have. A person who made you go see tons of properties all the hell over the place. And you know what? Sometimes we said yes. And why did we say yes? We said yes because we might, well, maybe we're suckers. How about nine years until they bought Cindy? My gosh. <laughs> it's like, masochist. All of my buyers from 2008 to 11, Andrew, I was there, man. And I remember that was less than fun time. But the reason that we said yes to that was not because we loved looking at houses. It's because we didn't have enough money to say, nah, I'm going to delegate that to my least favorite person. I'm going to let that one go to somebody else. Money's greatest, greatest intrinsic value is the ability to control your time. When you have a bunch of money, you don't have to do jobs you don't want to do. I don't have to take that that lead, right? But being honest, thank you, Carol, right? Yeah, when you're new to the business, you got to, I mean, the reality is when you're new to the business, most of us don't have a ton of money. Very few people come into real estate and they're just like independently wealthy and they're like, you know, I needed a hobby, okay? That's less than probably 2% of our company and we've got a pretty good company, okay? That's a very uncommon reality. Most of the time when we're in real estate, it's because we need to earn money. And if we don't have enough of it already, or we don't believe that we have enough of it, we'll take on some really bad jobs. And, uh, and to be candid with you, that would be, that could potentially be one of them. All right. So let's, uh, let's jump over here to the person in the new car. I know y'all are paying attention and I know the people who are paying attention are going to know I'm talking to them and myself. I'm putting a mirror up here. When you see someone in a hot or rare car, you don't think, wow, that person must be cool. I'm going to let that sink in for my own needs. 
So when someone sees someone in a hot or rare car, they don't look at that person and go, wow, I think that person's super cool. What they subconsciously think is if I had that car, people would think I'm cool. So in other words, when we're signaling that we're wealthy and that people should like and admire us, what really happens is people are ignoring you and they're focusing on the possession of that object and they're really envying the possession. So I want you to think about that for a minute. I want, I want us to share in the chat box. I used the car example. I'm going to give you a couple more while you're, while you're sharing. What is something that you've looked at, seen someone else have or doing and been like, yeah, I really want that. What is something that you've looked at and been like, yeah, I really want that. I think that'd be super cool. I envy that. That's something that's really neat. What is it? Homes. Yeah. Houses. Travel. I go to exotic places. A ski place. Yep. Mm -hmm. A trilobite carry. I think that's, I hope, a joke. A uh, house. <laughs> Carol. Yeah. Houses are really common. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and blow up the chat box for a second. I, I, I see people... I see people taking private jets, you know, because of COVID. They don't want to get on, uh, you know, they don't want to get on, you know, airplanes and first class isn't enough. So now they're, they're private jetting and they take that picture where they're sitting backwards in the airplane, right? A beachfront second home. Yep, Cindy, I'm with you. Nice jewelry. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, right. Here we go. Let's see if Matt, Chase, and uh, Kobe and everybody are still paying attention. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, a diamond implanted in my forehead. Yeah, I saw that. That's, uh, wasn't that little Uzi did that this week? put a diamond in his forehead. He gave himself an infinity stone, a husband. Carol, that might be outside the box on that one if I'm leveling with it. <laughs> but we look at those things, right? <laughs> a Porsche, thank you. So we, we see those kinds of things, right? And we look at it and we say, I envy the person who can do that, has that privilege, or do we really just like what it is that they're doing? And we think, hey, I'd love to do that. I'll give you guys an example. I, um, I had a... Uh, an opportunity, I, I threw the private jet thing out there. I had an opportunity about a month ago to, uh, to go on a private jet and uh, go down to, um, to Miami for the, uh, the national championship that Ohio State was in. But first stop with the jet was gonna be uh, the Browns playoff game in Pittsburgh. So it was gonna be Cleveland to Pittsburgh, immediately to Miami and then back to Cleveland. And uh, it was gonna be me and like seven other people and everyone was gonna pitch in a few thousand dollars. And I like thought about how cool that would be. And then the reality was, is that I realized I took a step back and I was like, man, that is really cool. But I don't, I don't think anything of the, of the people who are doing that. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of crazy. They're all from different backgrounds. They're going to jump on a tiny airplane and probably all catch coronavirus for one. But secondly, that's an exorbitant amount of money uh, just to get in the door and have, you know, two experiences at football games they could just as well watch on TV, right? I was envying the, their ability to just go do that and, and envying the fact that they had a private jet right? And that access to that and how cool that was. But I didn't at any point think, wow, those other seven people I'll be with must be super cool. Subconsciously, what I was thinking was, I guess I'd be kind of cool like them if I was able to just do that. <laughs> Chase, I appreciate your honesty, Matt. We talk about this all the time. <laughs> but impulse control, right? But I wanted to share that with you, that paradox, because that is a really deep psychological um, you know, lesson that I got from this book is that, is that we don't tend to, we, we don't realize, hence subconscious or unconscious, we don't realize oftentimes that when we see something really cool that someone else has, it intrinsically, subconsciously, we are thinking, well, I would be cool if I could do that same thing. Just something worth, worth sharing. And again, I appreciate all you guys participating so much, by the way, in the chat box. This has been great because um, otherwise you got to listen to all my boring insecurities. And those are, those are pretty, uh, Monica, great question. Did I regret not going? I don't. Not in the least bit. I really, really don't. I had a lot of fun watching the Browns game with my with my son, especially. He gets so excited. And uh, the Buckeyes game, I didn't watch the second half of, so I would have been pretty miserable uh, trapped in a, in a small uh, seating area of a, a loge with seven people I barely know. So, all right, let's move on. Are we wealthy or rich? The time old question. Are we wealthy or are we rich? If you're going to take notes, if you're going to take a picture, if you're going to screenshot something, this might be the thing to screenshot. It is a eye-opening perspective. Wealth is the financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. Let me say that again. Wealth is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the things that everybody can see. Let me say this a different way. Someone driving a $100,000 car very well may be wealthy. They very well may be wealthy, but the only data point you have about their wealth 
is that they have $100,000 less in the bank than they did before they bought the car or $100,000 less committed to. So consider this, that like that, that spending a million dollars is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. I'll say that again, spending a million dollars is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. But if you think about it, many of the people that you come in contact with, whether you realize it or not, they say they want to be millionaires, but they really don't want to be millionaires. What they want is to spend a million dollars. What they want is to be able to go anywhere they want, whenever they want and blow a million dollars on stuff and things. They don't actually want to be millionaires in terms of net worth with wealth. What they want to be able to do is have the flexibility to spend a million dollars. And those two things can run hand in hand, but I will level with you. Most of the people probably on this, on this Zoom today, uh, it would be the former, or it would be the latter, excuse me, that we want to spend a million dollars. We don't actually want to have a million dollars to our name and net worth. Spending a million dollars is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. People who live in big homes and drive fancy cars are rich. People with big incomes are rich. Oftentimes they will display the fact that they are in fact rich. But wealth is hidden. If you're writing it down, keep writing. Wealth is hidden. Wealth is the income you save, not the income you spend. Wealth is the income that you save, not that you spend. Now, I did not say invest, so hold that thought. Wealth is optionality, it's flexibility, it's growth, it's the ability to purchase the stuff that you may need if you needed it or that you may want if you needed it. But understand that spending a million dollars is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. And people with big incomes aren't necessarily wealthy. Hold that thought for just one second. How are you guys feeling about what we just said here? I see Carol said, you know, so true. How do you guys feel about this? Because this was this was one that really, uh, really hit me between between the eye, eyebrows a couple times in reading this chapter. And I'm summarizing it into one slide, you know, to keep the promise of this being a reverse book club and not overanalyzing every topic. But how do you guys feel about this particular one wealth versus being rich? You can go ahead and blow up the chat box. I see so many people with money live in big houses and they and don't think that way. Absolutely. And by the way, I'm not creating some war on big houses here on you guys. I'm just sharing, you know, what I read in a book. Wealth makes me feel a whole lot better than riches. Yeah. Yeah. Wealth, wealth can definitely make a lot of people feel better, right? It's financial security oftentimes. Thank you, Jade. Yeah, wealth is hidden. Wealth is income that's saved. It's optional. It's options. It's flexibility. It's growth. It's the ability to do the things that you might need to do when you need to do them. Um, and understand that when most people say that they want to be a millionaire, what they really want is to actually spend a million dollars. Um, yeah, wealth lets you say yes if your family's in need. <laughs> Matt likes both. And by the way, getting to both, Matt, is very purposeful. And we're going to talk about that too. Um, you know, what, Jermaine, thank you. Absolutely. Wealth builds legacy. And Brittany, I agree. You want both. I want both too. Understanding it's very difficult. It's very easy to get rich. And we'll talk about that later. Believe it or not, there's a lot of ways to do that. It's actually fairly difficult to get and stay wealthy. Um, however, once you've built wealth, you can stay wealthy. I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I represented a client uh, on a commercial transaction briefly um, that he bought, bought and closed in three days with all cash. And he had to send me his financial statements. He had more money in the one bank account that he sent me <clears throat> than I will probably see in a lifetime. Right? He had I think it was $165 million. And I was able to do the quick assessment that he was making more money in interest per year, or excuse me, more money in interest per month than I was earning an income for an entire year. And I have a fairly respectable income. And he was earning more money in interest per month than I was income per year. And that was just in his investment account, the one account that he sent me a copy of. I, I have no idea what the balance of his financials looked like. But I share that with you to understand that he built wealth and now he can enjoy a lot of riches, but it wouldn't have worked if he'd have gone the other way around, right? If when he was making 190,000 a year and 220, if he was going out and spending $5,000 on random jet jets, you know, to go from Pittsburgh to Miami and back, he blew all his riches. He wouldn't actually have gotten wealthy because nothing came to him by way of gift. It was purposeful decisions. And by the way, as an aside, and I, for those of you who know, I'm talking about keep it to yourselves, not, not, an incredibly well-educated person. And he would admit that he was just very purposeful. All right. So let's talk a little bit about saving money because for those of you who want both, I believe we have to save some money to do that. There's three kinds of people in this world. Those who save, 
those who don't think they can save and those who think they don't need to save. And because I said that, and it's the word save over and over, you might've tuned out. So I'm gonna say it again, but slower. And I want you to identify which one you fall into. There's three kinds of people in the world. Those who save money. That's starting to become me. Those who don't think they can save. And I will level with you, that is more people than you realize, folks. More people than we realize are living paycheck to paycheck and they just are like, oh, 401k, IRA, savings account. I can't save, I barely have enough money to get by. And then those who don't think they need to save. Let me say that again, three types of people. The third one is those who don't think they need to save. Yeah, the savers are of course gonna raise their hands. Helga and Brittany are like, no, 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 that's me, right? All the people in category three are like, well, who's he talking to? Why does he keep saying that, right? Those who don't think they need to save are the people who are earning a bunch of money right now and who are just like, yeah, next year we're for sure gonna go up. The market always gets better, right? So we're gonna make, if we made 190 this year, we're gonna make 210 next year. There's no way that I'm gonna break both my legs or something, right? So that is a legit thing. There's people who save, people who don't think they can, which may be some of you on this, and I'm not gonna ask you all to get too you know, personal on the chat box, but there's a lot of folks out there who don't think they need to. We're like, nah, I don't need to put any money aside. I got to keep it invested. I got to keep it active. I got to put more money into my practice. I got to hire more admins and buy more, buy more billboards and more shopping cart advertisements to make sure that everyone in Whole Foods knows I'm a realtor. Understand that your savings rate is oftentimes more important than your ROI, your return on investment. Let me share that with what I mean by that. The amount of money that you put aside is actually more important, believe it or not, than the percentage that you intend to gain on it. And we're going to talk about that again when we throw out the compound interest calculator. But the amount of money and the consistency by which you put that money away, and I am speaking hypocritically because I don't do it myself on a consistent level, that amount of money that we put aside and the regularity that we do it is more important than the returns that we get. Now, I'm not going to share names, but I will tell you the, uh, the story later on uh, today in the next half hour. I will tell you a story about somebody who's been putting away money very consistently over a very... Uh, extended period of time now and how much that will be worth uh, at the point that, that person retires early. I'll get to that. You can build wealth. Uh, this isn't, oh, well, let me see. Maybe I, maybe I did put this on a slide. You know, you guys saw I was working on this late. Yeah, I did. All right, here we go. You can build, <laughs> well, yes, Jordan, I knew you were kidding. <laughs> you can build wealth without high income. Okay. So pay attention to this. Move the pictures of everybody that's on your screen to the left side of the screen if you need to, so you can see the right side that says saving money. You can build wealth without a high income, but you have no chance of building wealth but for lottery tickets without a high savings rate. Let that sink in for a minute. Are you saying you work? If you're not putting money aside. Really, Steen? Nope, oh, somebody's unmuted here. Got it. You can't build wealth without putting money aside first. You have to have a high savings rate. And the way to do that is to learn to be happy with less money. If you learn to be happy with less money, that creates the gap between what you have and what you want. So many of you guys said, yeah, I want to be wealthy and I want to be rich. I want to have the money in the bank. And I also want to go and have a bunch of really fancy stuff. That's fine. I'm, I'm in no judgment of that. I actually share that with you. I think that'd be sweet, right? There's no way that we're going to be able to get there together independently or otherwise without putting money aside first. And in order to do that, we need to understand that how much money we make can't be how much we can live with. So in other words, if you make $100,000 a year, please don't spend all the way up to 100,000, right? You can't, you can't do that and put money aside for your wealth. It's not possible. This one really hit me and I'm sure some of you guys who are starting to zone out, hopefully can zone back in when I say this in my super slow and intense voice, past a certain level of income, what you need is just what sits below your ego. Past a certain level of income, what you actually need is only what sits just below your ego. Ouch. I feel like Morgan Housel was like tossing, Housel was throwing like darts at my forehead when I was reading this thing. But it's true, right? Like I think about, you know, 12 years ago, I made this big announcement. I said, I remember I was at a business planning clinic, Cindy, uh, the Emmermans were there, I'm sure. And, you know, some of the 
the folks who've been with Keller as long as me were in the room. And I said, I'm going to coach the Browns someday. It was right when I think I dropped out of football. And I said, I'm going to help the Browns win a Super Bowl by becoming a football coach. And the only way I can do that is once I get a million dollars in the bank, because at a million dollars in the bank at 7% interest, I'll have $70,000 a year that I can live off of passively while I make my $20,000 as an assistant coach for the Browns. What do you think changed between 2008 and present? A ton. Quality of life, right? What sits just below my ego? Yeah, in 2010, I could probably live off $70,000 a year. Now I can't, right? It's interesting to consider that, you know, yeah, kids, money, yeah, level, I mean, quality of life, right? If we make investments with our money that we're actively earning into our quality of life instead of into our savings account, we're going to be working a lot longer for that goal. I had the math all worked out. And by the way, I hit almost, I exceeded most of the revenue goals I had or my income goals. And I am no closer to earning the amount of money I need passively, I feel like in some ways to, to leave the industry than I was 10 years ago. Why? Because past a certain level of income, what you need is what sits just below your ego. And unfortunately, my ego grew a little bit. I'm not going to ask you guys if yours did too, but suddenly having a German car isn't enough. I needed two German cars at the same time, right? Some of you guys have, uh, have your own versions of that. Exactly. Mine did. I'm with you, Carol. So the solution to this is simply, you know, author putting it, but I'm sure there's more is don't feel like you need to worry about what other people think of you or the need to keep up with the Joneses. Um, you know, do what you need to do to continue your career and grow your wealth and then live up to the standards that are necessary to compete in the environment you compete in. And beyond that, bank it, build your wealth. And remember, again, we say this a lot, control of your time, control of your time is the most valuable currency that we actually have. Um, I'm just going to say it one more time because it bears repeating. You can build wealth without a high income, but you have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate. If you're not putting money away, it's not going to happen for you by a miracle. All right. This one was big for me. I couldn't help but think about my, my, uh, the leaders of our company when we're doing our budgets or, or our finance committee or, or my investor partners in the market center. I was thinking to myself, we, we come up with these budgets like a year in advance, right? And we know every single month exactly what we're going to spend and we never want to go over it and all those things. And this, this chapter kind of gave me an opportunity to exhale a little bit and say, you're doing okay, old buddy. Don't aim to be coldly rational when making financial decisions. Aim to be pretty reasonable. Aim to be pretty reasonable. Reasonable is a more realistic, and I know I hate the word, but the author used it. Reasonable is more realistic and you have a better chance of sticking with it in the long run, which is what matters most when we're managing our money. So if we create these incredibly rational, you know, ex expectations with our money, I'm going to spend exactly this much money and it's never going to be more. Um, that's sometimes unattainable and maybe sometimes unreasonable. And as we talked earlier, uh, you know, the author says so much of our financial, uh, you know, life is, is luck, is randomness, right? We have to consider making reasonable uh, estimations when it comes to our, our, our financials. Now, something I just wanted to throw out there for you. Also stick to your guns. So once you create a reasonable plan, something that makes sense, that should logically work, but isn't like so stringent that you can't ever flex from it, understand the bottom right of your screen right now, which is that the historical odds of making money when generally invested over time, if you put any amount of money into the stock market, history tells us in any amount that in any 10 year period, you have 88% likelihood of making, of not just getting your existing money back when you withdraw it, but of actually making more money. By the way, in the past like 13 years, I have been through two massive recessions, okay? And look at what it says right below that. 100% odds of making money over any 20 year period in the history, obviously looking backwards, I'm not giving financial advice, but if you put money in play in an investment, in an active investment over any 20 year period, there's not a 20 year period in the history of the United States, including the Great Depression, the Great Recession, the most recent pandemic or any of the uh, epidemics before that, there is nothing, there's not one 20 year period you can point to where your money would have went down. Isn't that crazy? People are like, oh, it's all about timing the market. You got to buy low, sell high. BS, it's about putting money aside and having time. It's about putting money aside and having time. All right, this is a fun one. Surprise, things that have never happened before happen all the time. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. That was a Scott Sagan quote. I thought it was pretty, pretty funny because we have to be prepared for surprises. Um, you know, there are, there are, are major, major um, outlier events that happen um, that can 
drastically change um, our futures. And we have to be considerable. We have to consider that those possibilities are going to exist. I'm going to give you guys a, just maybe one in the interest of time. And that's that there have been approximately 15 people, 15, excuse me, 15 people. That's not true. There have been 15 billion people born in the 19th and 20th century. 15 billion people born in the 19th and 20th centuries. But I want you to consider the handful of people who inordinately influenced historical events. And these are some names you're not going to want to hear, but I want you to think about them. 15 billion people. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, or let's go to the other side, Thomas Edison, Bill Gates. 15 billion people have been born, but those five that I just named in or, it, it, it had extraordinary impact for worse in the first few cases and certainly better on the entire future of our financial lives, whether we realize it or can link back to it or not. Consider this, the, the, the projects and innovations of the last century that there was the Great Depression, there was World War II, there was vaccines, major vaccines, not even just the current ones, which are impacting the market right as we speak, but polio vaccines, you know, a long time ago and so forth. Antibiotics was a huge evolution in medicine in the past century. Um, the internet, probably the biggest in my lifetime was the rise of the internet. When I was 14 years old, we got this thing. They're like, there's going to be electronic mail and you can send mail to people and you can do it through your computer. That's going to be pretty cool. And then that became the whole internet that we carry around with us all the, all the time. How about the fall of the Soviet Union? There were major outlier events that are dictating things that are impacting our finances today and understand that you had no control over any of them. You had no control over any of them. Quick, uh, quick chat box play. How many of you guys had money invested in the stock market 11 months ago? How many of you have money invested in stock market or mutual funds 11 months ago? Me, me, me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Bunch of you, all kinds of people. Yeah, I did, right? I did a little bit. Not much, but I did. A couple stocks that I looked at went down 86% in 48 hours. Disney went down 50% in two days. General Motors went down 90% in a three-day period. MGM, the stock that owns the casinos, went down 86% in two days. That had nothing to do with any of you. You had no control over that reality, but it happened to your portfolios. So we have to be prepared for surprise, out, out overlooking outliers that move the needle, major, major events. And then we have to be able to look at those, say, okay, that happens and that will